This is Ray Styers, really good friend of mine. This is Ray's buddy. This is North Carolina. North Carolina. That's his six wave land. Been using it for 30 years. 30 years. Uh, I've made mistakes. This is one of them. I go to meetings like this, guys will talk, seed companies will talk, and other farmers will talk. I use this great legume. It's called Green Fix Chickling Vetch. This guy was telling me about 250 pounds of nitrogen, how fast it grew. I come back from that meeting, I said, got to have some of that, so I ordered it. 30 days after planting, it does this. This is 9.30, it's blooming. Planted August the 1st. Guess what it did when it bloomed? Got roots. Where's the nodulation? There is none. It moved it up to make the flower. No nitrogen from this. Two bucks a pound. David don't use that anymore. <laughs> I mean, you know, we tried. I think if we plant it later, we'd be okay. Use a lot of buckwheat, especially on new farms. Farms that has really low pHs, low phosphorus readings. That much buckwheat in the field will bring up 12 pounds of phosphorus next year's crop. Buckwheat's a really cool crop. Now the thing about buckwheat is it will seed on you really quickly, so you have to be careful. That is 30 days after planting. If you're organic, you don't want it. Or you want to make darn sure you're terminated before it blooms. Because the first bloom you see, there's a seed there. And then it's an obnoxious weed. The neat thing about it when we have this, I call the beekeepers of Ohio, 10 hives per acre. Cost them 30 bucks per hive to set them there. Somebody just did the math. That's 300 bucks. Do I need to grow corn? You know. What's the difference between a noxious weed and a cover crop? Well, a noxious weed's one you don't want, <laughs> but a cover well, crop. So management. Management, right. This, as far as I'm concerned, is an noxious weed. But this is a cover crop everybody likes. We can't kill it. And you got, don't, want, don't want to get mixed up with annual ryegrass versus cereal rye. This is annual ryegrass. It's short. It's really great for pasture. If it gets more than eight inches tall, it's tough to kill. And the root mass is amazing. The root mass is amazing. This is a new one we're working with. It's called Priscilla. I really like it. It looks good. It's all how you use your plants. Yeah. This plant has a 60 inch root in 30 days. In 30 days. That's all we use it for, root. And it's a great, look at the pollinators. Yeah. You know, beneficial insects. There's our planter. It's an eight row with seven splitters. There's what made us famous. This is a soybean plate. There's winter peas here. This is a sugar beet plate. These are reddishes. You're planting two species, two different sizes. The implement company says it can't be done. Guess what, guys? Works. 36,000 of these plates sold 10 years ago. I sold them for white. They love me, you know? Maybe they should give you a new planter. Yeah, maybe they should. <laughs> this, is a P, this is a P row, this is a reddish row, 15 inches apart. These are spaced just like a corn plant, four and a half inches apart. Peas are three and a half inches apart. 17 bucks an acre, pretty cheap cover, you know? Now, not the diversity that an 8 or 10 or 12 has, but I think this is one good way to start. You know, get your soil started. Get some diversity. Those are my tubers in the soil. I put this picture in because you remember the winter peas, the nodulation we had from them, but they were smaller. For some reason, I guess they call that a synergistic effect, when you put this plant beside this one, it makes both of them do better. You know? So we found out the winter Perdee produces 25% more nodules, which means the tube of the reddish is two inches deeper and an inch bigger around than when it's by itself. And what I like about this mix that Dave has, if you notice how great those lagoons for aggregation, that'll build a big pour, but the aggregation with those two together is much better than just one single species. Rarely do we ever recommend a single species cover crop. Only if you have a purpose for it. Right. So we gotta, you got to learn what to put, put and how. Where to put it. Yeah. This is, uh, this is volunteer wheat. That's all that's left of the volunteer wheat. But you can see if you get a good stand of peas and reddishes, it will choke out the wheat. I liked it because it froze out. I'm cheap. I don't need to use herbicide. You know, I can get by without one shot of herbicide. Maybe two. 
What Ray talked about was cottage cheese in the soil. Look at that cottage cheese. You know. That's what your soil should look like. You will not see those in a lot of organic or conventional till systems. Why? We talked about that. Yeah, you're just tilling. Too much tillage. What I wanted to show you, this is this 14 inch spade. There's 12 inches deep and we still have granular effect. We do not have, you see no plow pan. You'll see no difference in that from top to bottom. You know. Again, there we're planting the peas and radishes. What did we find? We planted corn in the reddish row. If the corn row hits the reddish row, it's up two days sooner than where it's in the winter pea row. So that's why we try to plant on the reddish row. You know. This is the 12th of May. This is May the first plant of corn. It's three leaf already. Three leaf already. This is a reddish carcass. And I'm a guy that likes to think about making money. Jay can tell that from his lifetime with me. And I saw that and I went out there and I picked that thing up and that's like a loofah sponge. You know, it's kind of crispy, you know. So I got this great idea. I run to the hardware store, bought quarter inch dowel rods and three eighths dowel rods, cut them in half, two foot long. I give them to my wife. I says, run out there, pick up all the reddishes that you find like this. We'll glue these together. We'll sell them at the farmer's market for back scratchers. Didn't fly. <laughs> Didn't fly, you know. Uh, if you miss the reddish row, I just wanted to show you, there's what the reddish row looks like. The reddish row actually does tillage. It actually lifts the soil three to five inches. Can you imagine when I have a four inch rainfall in an hour, how much water is going to go in them holes? And we still have, look at the armor on the soil. There's no way that soil is going to erode. You know. Again, I love them, so you're going to see lots of pictures of green because in October, there's not a leaf on a tree. The cornfields are all brown, the bean fields are all brown, the dust is flying, and I just love to see green. You know, here's our results. Here's peas and radishes for next year. This is last year's corn. 227 bushel corn with no nitrogen. There's sun hemp. We tried this five years ago. I don't know what the problem was. I bought a bag, brought it home. Another meeting like this. Met a guy from Africa. He says, I'll get you some. I said, fine. I wasn't thinking. I should have kept my mouth shut. You know. He says, I'll give you the sun hemp. You just pay the freight. Well, the 50-pound bag showed up by UPS and was $436 freight. Gosh. You know. So we tried it. It was growing like that. And, you know, I'd go there every three or four days and take a sample and dig the roots. And I found that it blew head nodules about the size of quarters, which is great. But every time I'd go to the field... The state patrol the deputy sheriff would stop, you know, and, I, and then he'd go on. And then, you know, about three days later, I was back in the field, and all of a sudden, here comes the deputy sheriffs and two state patrols, and they jump out of the car and run out in the field. And I said, what's the matter, guys? He says, well, what are you doing? And I says, I'm looking at my cover crop. Well, he says, what is that? And I says, it's sun hemp. You know what it is? I said, yeah. I bought it to grow nitrogen. Dug the root, showed him. He says, you mean... You're not smoking that? And I said, could I? <laughs> you know. So, you know, you have to explain some things that's going on sometimes in the community, you know. But there it is. There's how high it gets. It's six foot tall. I didn't, forgot to tell you. The guy showed a picture of it from Africa. It's 25 foot tall, grows that tall in 60 days in Africa, and has nodules the size of golf balls. That's why I said I had to have it. I forgot we don't have African weather. But so it only got six foot tall, you know. There's the nodulation though, guys. Look at that. Sorry about the focus, but look at the nodules. And the roots, you know, I was excited. Neat thing was, first day of October, it was 31 degrees, froze. But look in between the rows. Look how dark green them reddishes are. The reddishes were two inches bigger here in de depth and soil. And I think it was going for sunlight. It's like the woods and the trees, you know. Again, there's, there it is, what it looks like in the winter. Sun hips dead, reddishes are still green. Faba beans has been a bust, other than if we put them in a blend. We like them in a blend. They don't work well by themselves. There's what happens in the wintertime is with faba beans. This is what I wanted to show you, after all the work that we've done. This is a five-year study. This is replicated plots. 
Five different fields, five different years. So there's 25 fields here. These are the average nutrients they found at Ohio State University the day we planted the corn. We send them soil samples the day we plant the corn so they can tell us what we need to put on. As you can see there, Dave Brandt does not need to buy any fertilizer. You know. We loosen to compaction, that's what that's saying. Uh, if we looked uh, right there, that's with cover crop and five years of no-till. You take a probe, push it in the ground, took 100 pounds of pressure. Where there was no cover crop, five years no-till took over 230 pounds. We loosened the soil with the peas and radishes. There's the benefits. Everybody can read. This is a spad meter or a chlorophyll meter. What it's doing is collecting, looking at the color of the leaf. You know, this is a guide how I judge how much nitrogen is there. On our farm, if that number says 42 parts, I got enough nitrogen in the plant for 200 bushel corn. You know, that's done by trial and error. Now, you can't you tell me, if you was doing this and you're looking at the cornfield, you couldn't tell me that that field needed nitrogen versus that field without a meter? You know? But I was so damn stubborn, I thought, well, that meter can't be right. And that actually cost me 50 bushel corn. You know? But it's interesting, 30 parts per million wasn't enough. That's what I'm saying. You know? There's a the difference. Look at the color of that leaf versus the color of this leaf. You can actually see it.